So welcome everyone uh, to this uh, Bruegel event on can we claim victory over inflation. Uh, so the purpose of the event is uh, of course to answer the question. But in order to answer the question we, we need to understand what is behind inflation and what is behind the persistence uh, of inflation. And to make us understand that we have uh, with us, I would say, two of the greatest economists of all times. We have Olivier Blanchard, who is uh, joining us from Ile de Ré. Um, he is, of course, uh, emeritus professor at MIT and a senior fellow at the Peterson Institute. He, he was also my thesis advisor, which makes it extremely difficult for me to contradict him on anything, though it has happened uh, very occasionally. And then we have um, my, my great friend and, and colleague, Lucrezia Reichlin from London Business School, uh, who started out as a, a super innovative and influential econometrician and then eventually found her way to macro. And, and one of the ways she did it is by being the uh, director of research of the European Central Bank. And so she has had a very strong interest in monetary policy ever uh, since then. Uh, so, the two speakers will partly base their remarks on two important uh, intellectual uh, pieces that they have been uh, working on recently in the case of Lucrezia. This is the 2023 Geneva report of the uh, Center for um, Economic Policy Research, CEPR. This is the flagship report uh, of CEPR. It, it analyzes uh, the inflation process. Um, particularly in the euro area, but also uh, with some reference to the US and other uh, countries and, and comes essentially up with a theory and some evidence on why uh, inflation has been persistent and, and is likely to be persistent. In the case of Olivier, he has an extremely influential paper with Ben Bernanke that was published in the summer. Uh, and as I understand it, his initial remarks will also be based on that paper. And what I would invite you as the audience to look for is to what extent these uh, two stories that you will hear have overlaps, similarities, whether they contradict each other and and what they what they imply for the for the title question. So the, the rules are, uh, Lucrezia will start with a roughly 10 minute uh, presentation. Uh, Olivier will follow with another 10 minutes. I will ask them a few questions and then we will uh, turn over to the audience, both in the room and online. Uh, for the online audience, you can participate via Slido, which you can reach on your, iPhone, on your phone, on your mobile phone or on your uh, computer. And the Slido code for this event is hashtag inflation lessons in one word, uh, small caps. Lucrezia, floor is yours. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, as Jeremy said, I mean, I'm going to present some ideas uh, on a, a report uh, issue called the Geneva Report issued by the CPR, which will be published next week. And uh, in that report, uh, we take a contrarian view. So what has been, uh, you know, the dominant view so far is that inflation in both the U.S. and the euro area have had uh, as a cause excess demand that uh, central bankers uh, reacted late uh, in increasing interest rates, uh, so policy mistakes, uh, and uh, that uh, central banks now need to act massively um, to, uh, you know, because, you know, core inflation uh, has proved to be very persistent. Uh, and unexpectedly persistent, uh, and therefore there are risk of the anchor of expectation and possibly wage spi spirals. So the point uh, uh, that I want to put forward uh, uh, is kind of to challenge uh, this view, and uh, actually the center of the report and of our work has been to try to understand uh, supply shocks and their propagations, uh, and what we claim is that uh, the propagation of supply shocks uh, and uh, you know, the behavior in the good market is the bulk of the story for both the US and the Euro area, although there are differences between the US and the Euro area. And for the US, you know, there is obviously also some uh, you know, demand pressures, uh, any particular fiscal policy had a large role to play. But uh, in the Euro area, 
we not only the supply shocks was uh, much larger, but uh, also oh, this imply ad ad adverse uh, uh, terms of trade shock. Since Europe uh, is an imported of energy, net imported of energy, so that shock affected not only supply but also demand in the in the negative uh, in the negative sense. So this combination of the different uh, type of shocks uh, in the euro area. And, uh, um, and maybe the, the less fiscal support, uh, which affects the demand side, uh, um, you know, makes it, you know, brought, you know, leads to a situation in which we can argue that, that there is a risk of over tightening in the euro area. So let me give you a few uh, charts to substantiate what I'm going to say. Um, first of all, uh, okay, we have been facing. Uh, uh, a large shock, but everybody knows it, so I will skip those charts. I will uh, uh, put your attention on, on this chart in particular. So the large energy shock, these are US data actually, the large energy shock was also associated with very large changes in relative prices. And uh, this is something that uh, it, it's an important feature that uh, um, explain the mechanism of propagation as I will argue. Uh, the, the, the other observation is the behavior of the terms of trade. As I already mentioned, the difference between the US and the Euro area, the yellow is the US and the Euro area uh, is, in, uh, um, is in blue, um, you know, which means that the, the shock was quite different uh, in, the, in the two jurisdictions. Now, this difference in the terms of trade also explains the behavior of the real economy. And here I want to point to two charts, consumption and investment. You have real consumption for the euro area uh, on the left and the, on, the, on the right you have the US. In relationship to the pre-2019 trend, um, you see that consumption has been very weak and, uh, and we are not back to trend in the euro area. But uh, you know, for investment, um, Notwithstanding uh, all the European programs, uh, uh, you know the situation is quite different. Okay, so this is uh, uh, so that kind of points to the difference between the the the, 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 the different jurisdictions. Okay. So in response to that, there was massive monetary tightening, as you can see here, for example, from comparing the federal fund rate and the deposit facility rate at the ECB. Uh, you know, we are just seeing the ECB has tightened for the 14th consecutive quarter, and you know, we are now at, uh, you know, and if you, if you think that we started with negative interest rate in July 2022, this is really, you know, has no historical precedence. Now, at the same time, this inflation has been taking place, okay? So if you look at this chart where you see both inflation and core for Euro area and the US, you see that this inflation has actually been quite rapid, but actually core inflation have been persistent, and this act is this what the policymakers are focusing on. To give you an idea of how massive this inflation has been, you can compare the dif different episodes of these inflations. Here you have the two episodes in the 70s, and then uh, the recent episodes um, with US and Euro area. You see that this inflation has been more rapid even that the famous Volcker disinflation. And in fact, if you look at, uh, uh, at the historical um, you know, dynamics uh, of inflation for the US since, uh, since the late 50s, uh, and you can see the peak of the, uh, of the uh, late 70s and early 80s on inflation, uh, and here you have inflation and the federal funds rate for the US, so you see that even in the Volcker disinflation, uh, which was you know, the, you know, an historical benchmark, uh, inflation went down, but not so rapidly, and actually stays between 3.5 and 4% until the, the late 90s. Okay, so let me talk about some puzzles. Okay, so the first puzzle is, uh, but if you know, this massive response, why is core inflation so persistent? And uh, here, I mean, what we claim in the report is actually that supply shocks are different, and um, and the, you know, as the regional shock reversed, uh, the energy shock reversed, uh, in, uh, headline inflation declines, but the core inflation remains persistent because there are this lag wave of sectoral inflation. And this actually, you can see it in the data, in the heterogeneity of the inflation response 
to uh, sector heterogeneity of, uh, of inflation response uh, to, to supply shocks. And persistent uh, is actually stronger the more rigid prices are. So the key mechanism is the, transmission, is the fact that the transmission mechanism depends on the input-output structure of the economy and on the sector of price thickness. So let me just give you some of our um, uh, econometric evidence. Uh, these are impulse response function to supply exogenous all supply shocks on historical data. So what has been the evidence in history? Uh, this is for the euro area. You see that uh, in the central panel you have the reaction to the inflation of the inflation rate, and on the right panel we have core. You see that core doesn't increase that much on impact, uh, but actually has a lagged effect to you know to the original increase, and then it goes down very very gradually. So you know this points to persistent to very high persistent actually from the initial impact uh, to you know to the full absorption we have. Uh, 60 months, almost five years. Now, if you compare the euro area and the US, you see that the euro area has much more persistent in core than in the US. And this actually, you know, support the idea that actually price rigidity matters. And, uh, you know, there is a lot of empirical work pointing to higher price rigidity in the euro area than the US, which explains why core has been more persistent. Now, I'm not going to go through these charts because it's complicated to read, but this chart is there to say that if you have the same exercise at the sectoral level, you can say a lot of heterogeneity across sectors in response to the oil shock, much more heterogeneity in response to an oil shock than in response to demand. So these facts, I think, are interesting, and they can be put together in some kind of frameworks, but central banks haven't really paid much attention to that. Um, you know, you need, you know, uh, models which have more than one sector, we need nominal rigidity, we need, uh, you know, to have the possibility of, uh, you know, highlighting these input out uh, linkages uh, which are key on the transmission and this is what uh, we, we do in the report uh, uh, with a stylized model. But importantly, this kind of analysis has a normative implication that um, you know, if there are no, uh, nominal rigidities that prevent sectoral relative prices to adjust in response to an energy shock, this generates less reallocation that you would like, uh, and so less reallocation that you would have uh, in a kind of fl flexible prices economy. So this leads to inefficiency, and you, you know, and you have to be, so it's not just a demand issue, but it's also an efficiency issue, so you may want to have uh, an inflation uh, rate, which is for a while, is a little bit higher uh, so that to oil the wheel in a way, to you know, allow the economy to adjust to these relative prices. Okay, the second uh, puzzle is uh, why has the, uh, the economy so, uh, so resilient? Uh, so now this has been true in a way for both the US and the Euro area. Um, you know, there are different conjectures there, but I want to just point to one thing so that uh, all the data point uh, to a much uh, stronger resilience of the US economy than the Euro area. Here you have, uh, you know, just the last two quarters uh, as an example, but, um, you know, all of us uh, have read that the, um, you know, while the, the, the Federal Reserve has adjusted upward the expectations on growth uh, for the next year, the opposite has happened for the euro area, both the commissions and the ECB have revised uh, their, their forecast downwards. So what, what is going on? Okay, so one conjecture that we don't analyze but we just su suggest is that actually that in the US fiscal policy has been much more supportive and actually, if you want to understand something about unemployment, I think this chart, uh, this is for the US, is interesting because it shows the historical correlation between bankruptcies and unemployment. You see that they are tightly correlated uh, and, uh, you know, the, the fiscal support uh, explains why bankruptcy have been so low and very low given the, the stage of the cycle, the monetary cycle where we are. So, in a way, um, an another uh, uh, I think interesting chart is the disposable income, the disposable personal income uh, in the U.S. Uh, total in red uh, and ex excluding transfers. Uh, 
in black, which also shows how you know, disposable income was supported uh, by the US fiscal policies, which did not happen in the euro area. So I think the, the differences in the shocks, which I highlighted at the beginning, plus the role of fiscal policy probably has some, you know, uh, go, you know, is part of the explanation of why this lack, this divergence now of real economic conditions. The third observation is that inflation's uh, expectations have been anchored, but this, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna show you our analysis for uh, given the, the, the time constraints. Uh, uh, but I think what is interesting about the, uh, the inflation expectations is that unlike in the 80s, they have remained uh, quite uh, anchored. And actually, if you study, you know, the behavior of, uh, you know, the degree of anchoring, in 2008, when we had a massive recession, uh, inflation expectations got de-anchored quite a lot because, uh, you know, there were risk of deflation. And that, that de-anchoring is most, much more substantial than the de-anchoring that we are seeing now facing inflation. So the bottom line, putting these factors together, we concluded that uh, we should not be surprised by persistent of core inflation. This is explained by the supply transmission and uneven shocks with price rigidity. We should not be surprised by higher persistent the euro area in the US, higher price rigidity, not by the better performance of the US because of the natural shocks and fiscal policy. And, uh, you know, also this is food for thought for monetary policies. This is case for patients, if you believe our story on the supply transmission, importance of fiscal policy for, you know, determining uh, inflation, and then, uh, you know, food for thought for the future in face of supply shocks, climate, and so on. Uh, there is a case for patients. Thank you. Does it work? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Um, perhaps you can take down the presentation and Olivier will go, uh, go next. Um, I have two slides. I suspect that they are going to show up in a second. Mm -hmm. um, for those of you who uh, were expecting disagreement, uh, you're going to be fully disappointed. Uh, I basically entirely agree with the way Lucrezia has presented things and the implication that things are a bit different on both sides of, of the ocean. So some of what I'm going to do is going to repeat in my own words things that uh, Lucrezia's uh, presentation actually covered. Let me move to uh, the slides. So I'm going to focus mostly on US inflation and then we'll compare, I think, uh, the, the two sides of the, of the ocean after. Uh, this is indeed based, as uh, Jerome said, on a paper which I have with uh, Ben Bernanke in which we write down more, estimate more, and draw conclusions from it. And if you're interested, it is on the Patterson site and it is on the Bookings uh, site. So when demand started to increase after the COVID uh, slump, uh, both because of just natural recovery and because of the various fiscal programs, the, the focus of the Fed was very much on the labor market. The notion that this was going to affect unemployment, unemployment would have an effect on wages. This might lead to some inflation. But the view of the Fed was that the Phillips curve was very flat that even if there was other heating, and some people thought it was actually a good thing, um, it would not have much effect on inflation. We'd see a bit more wage inflation, and price inflation would basically reflect wage inflation. And in retrospect, that was clearly wrong. Now, the source of a mistake is exactly what uh, Lucrezia uh, focused on, which is that the focus on the labor market was the wrong focus. Um, the most of the action in quantitative terms came from, from the goods market. Now, in general, the, the, the focus on just the labor market is not wrong. I mean, you basically get pressure on wages. Firms have the ability to produce more, a bit more, say 10% more without doing anything crazy. So they more or less keep the same markup. And as a result, price inflation reflects wage inflation. So you really want to look at the source of 
wage inflation. That's exactly what did not happen and was not anticipated by, by the Fed and by most observers. Uh, what happened was a combination of two things, uh, especially in the US. There was much higher demand in the fiscal programs were indeed gigantic uh, by historical standards. So even that would have been, uh, this would have been putting pressure on production in, in some sectors. But in addition, there were all kinds of supply chain disruptions, various types of disruptions, so much tighter supply in a number of sectors. Uh, the automobile industry is, is a marvelous example of this because of chips. They basically could not produce car. So as a result, you basically got for given wages in some sectors, very large increases in prices. Automobiles being, uh, you know, an example of that. So the source of uh, just from a purely uh, decomposition point of view, the source of the inflation that we saw through uh, from 2021 on uh, has come from relative price increases, both in commodity prices in general, where the, there was no problem with supply and demand, but there was strong world demand and that increased commodity prices overall. And then at the micro level, all kinds of shortages in various places. What we find uh, in the paper with Ben is that our measure of shortage does a really good job of explaining price inflation given wage inflation. So that's where the mistake was. This is where the action uh, turned out to be. Now, relative price increases can lead to very strong and lasting inflation. This is the stories of, a, of the 70s in which you had oil price shocks and they led to increasing core, which were fairly hard to get rid of. Now, there are two conditions for relative price increases to get into inflation and make it very persistent. The first one is uh, is catch up, which is that what happens is the price of some goods goes up given wages, and therefore the real wage goes down, and workers try to catch up. Now in the indexing uh, clauses, as they were in the 70s, that's automatic, uh, but otherwise it can still happen. The workers can be in a strong position and ask for increases in wages, which will lead to a second round of price increases. And that, surprisingly, has not happened. Uh, at least we could not find it. We looked very hard for it, and we did not find any catch-up, substantial catch-up. Now, the other way is that you don't try to catch up, but you're worried about future inflation because you see current inflation being higher, and you worry that it's going to last. And so this is the issue of the anchoring of expectations, which Lucrezia referred to. And that, again, did not happen at all. When you basically look at the relation of long-run expectations to inflation, uh, the weight on current inflation did not increase. It actually decreased a little bit. So given that, what happened is that there were these very strong relative price shocks quarter after quarter or month after month, but they did not really get into uh, inflation very much. Uh, so what happened is when the relative price shocks decreased in intensity, or some of them reversed, uh, as it is the case, for example, for automobiles at this point, then the burst, which happened in one month, just did, uh, was undone later, and we got a fairly large decrease in inflation uh, as the price shocks were basically going away and not getting into the pipeline. So the issue now, and that's what we have to discuss, is inflation has come down to, depending on how you measure it, whether you're on year, month on month, and so on, uh, around 3 to 4% in the US. Now, the force which was there but was not playing a major role is the labor market overheating. It was always there, but it didn't have a strong effect because, indeed, the slope of the Phillips curve is fairly flat. So most of the action was in the prices, not in the wages. Uh, but now that the price action is largely gone, then the fact that the labor market is still overheating in the US means that given that the slope of the Phillips curve is very flat, it's going to be tough to go to 2%. And I think that's the challenge that the Fed is, 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 is facing. Let me go to the second slide. I just have two slides. And take the, uh, the open questions. And, and my list is not unlike uh, Lucrezia's. So the first one for the US is how much of a heating 
of the labor market there is. Now, if you look at the unemployment rate, it's more or less where it was just pre-COVID, right around 3.5. And we thought at the time, maybe this was the natural rate. It was fine. Now, I think most of us believe that the natural rate is higher than that. The reason for this is this rather nerdy discussion about the beverage curve and the uh, joint behavior of vacancies and unemployment. So while the unemployment rate is back to its 2019 level, more or less, the ratio of vacancies to unemployment is much higher. It shifted up a whole lot, and it has come down, uh, but not all the way. And when you think about the labor market, it looks like the and you or the other you, vacancies of unemployment, is a better measure of the tightness of the labor market. So if you believe that, then the labor market is still overheating in the US. And that means that somehow unemployment has to increase uh, at least a bit. And my guess would be 1% at least or something like this. The second point is not declaring partial victory uh, too early. And I worry about catch up. Uh, I still worry. I couldn't find it in the data, and maybe it didn't happen yet. But you now have in the US the UAW strike and with crazy, crazy demands. Uh, if uh, it, uh, I'm sure that they don't expect to, to get all of it, but it's an indication that they feel that they're in a strong position and they have seen high profits and they want some of it. And I worry that maybe the effect is going to be is going to go beyond uh, the uh, automobile sector and that we're going to get catch up. If we get some catch up effect, then that puts pressure on wages at a given unemployment rate and will lead, will make it even hard, harder for the Fed to actually get inflation down to 2%. The third question is more for history, but for history, but it's relevant, which is suppose that there hadn't been the very large fiscal packages, in particular the Biden uh, March 2021 package, uh, how things, how different would things be? Would demand be sufficiently lower that the supply constraints would have played a minor role? My guess is no. Uh, it's really a combination of both. And even if fiscal policy had been reasonable, which I think it was not, uh, we would still have had these relative price increases in the in in the in the goods market. Next point is just rephrasing this, which is, you know, what is the responsibility of the Trump uh, packages and the Biden packages one year later uh, for uh, on for generating inflation? I think some, but probably the supply constraints were quite relevant. The last point on the slide is the issue of higher profits. And this line about greedflation you know, and the extreme view is inflation is due to greed and increase in profits. That's clearly wrong. But the question is whether it, higher profits have contributed to inflation. And my sense is, I think profits are higher. That's, uh, you know, that's uh, unassailable. That's true. But I think that's exactly what happens when you have shortages. When you have shortages in a competitive market, then you operate on the vertical portion of the supply curve. And as a result, if demand is sufficiently inelastic, then you basically get an increase in profits in the short run. I think that that's what has happened to a large extent. I don't think that greed per se has played an important role, but the issue is not going to go away because politically it is uh, it, it is an important one. I will add one thing about co-inflation, which is not on the slide, but was triggered by Lucrezia's presentation, which is... The reason we look at co-inflation is that we think that most of the time, the big relative price changes come from food and from energy. And so it's a good idea to take them out and then see what remains. In this case, that's not clear that it makes a lot of sense. Clearly, food and energy should be taken out. That's the problem with it. But you're going to keep in the core uh, inflation measure all kinds of relative price uh, increases which come from shortages in a sector, which is still producing goods, which are included in co-inflation. So I think co-inflation is actually quite misleading at this point. It still contains some of these relative price increases, rather than the persistence of the input-output effects that Lucrezia was mentioning. So this is a warning that co-inflation in the current context 
may not be provide viable. Let me end on the US, just mention something else about other countries. Uh, when we did the paper with Ben, we were approached by a number of central banks saying, well, the framework seems interesting. Let's try to estimate it for our economy. So we got in touch with the UK, uh, with the BOE, with the ECB, with the BOJ. And in the end, we had 11 central banks wanting to participate. And they have estimated the same model as, uh, as we did for the US, adapting it a bit because each country is a bit different. And I think the conclusions are quite similar. Uh, the similarities is, again, most of the inflation burst is due to relative price increases, not pressure from the labor market. There is very little evidence of catch up. And again, I wonder why, but it seems to be the case. There is nearly no evidence of de anchoring. Short run expectations, one year expectations have increased with inflation. Not very much, but they have increased, and that makes complete sense. The important one is what about long run expectations? And these have really haven't moved at all. The difference is, and I think that when we go to a discussion is going to be uh, you know, central, is the degree of overheating and the source of inflation on both sides of the ocean. In the US, I'm quite convinced that demand played a central role, that there is overheating in the labor market. I'm much less convinced of this on, the, um, on this side of the ocean. It seems to me that to a large extent, this is imported inflation due to shortages, due to energy, due to Ukraine. But I don't have a sense that there is overheating in the labor market. Um, the question is, when you look at the Eurozone, uh, there might be overheating in Germany, for all I know, but there is no overheating for the Eurozone as a whole, as I can see. Which means that in terms of monetary policy, if you believe that expectations are well anchored, then there is really no need to want to slow down the economy very much. You do it only if you think expectations are going to de-anchor or you think catch-up is coming. And I don't know if Lucrezia agrees, but I think she does. I don't see any sign of this at this point. Let me stop here and uh, hope for, and look forward to a discussion. Thank you so much. So, so this was uh, fascinating and what, whether your stories are consistent is difficult to tell because you told different stories about different countries. <laughs> but we'll, we'll find out. Um, so may, maybe let me start with, um, uh, with uh, Olivier. And this is mostly about confirming what I, I thought I heard you say. First, it seems to me that when it comes to the US, what you were saying is actually has, has pretty hawkish implications for what the Fed should do next. Uh, and the reason is that you made two points. One, um, unemployment is likely below the natural rate, uh, so it should be going up. Uh, so for that, presumably, we need tighter policy or we need policy to remain tight for a while. Second, we have the United Auto Workers precedent uh, which looks scary uh, when you are worried about a second round wage effects. So it seems to me that, you know, for all the, you know, dovish agreement, these, this actually is a pretty hawkish uh, stance. And maybe if you can comment on that, if you could confirm that, and also say, to, you know, how far are you willing to say that the, that the uh, euro area is, is really fundamentally different and that there's a much great uh, a case for patience here, notwithstanding the fact that core inflation remains high. You, you also said it's maybe not the right variable, so maybe that does suggest that one should simply ignore the persistence of core inflation and, and be very patient, uh, like Lucrezia said. So I will confirm that you got it exactly right. <laughs> It's good I was not misinterpreted. And I'm indeed uh, somewhat hawkish, which for a well-known dove is, uh, is a statement. Uh, I think, based on what I see, I think unemployment is indeed below the natural rate. Now, on this, I put a probability of 0.8 uh, because the shift in the beverage curve has largely on, undone itself about halfway. 
And I did not predict that. And there is a possibility that it completely undoes itself, in which case maybe we don't need more unemployment than uh, the natural rate is still 3.5 or something like this. Uh, even if it is, uh, to the extent that you want to slow down inflation, you have to go above it a bit. But yes, I believe very strongly that we need more unemployment. Uh, and I would be very happy to be proven wrong, but not expecting to be. Um, on the catch-up, I think we have to watch out for it. I worry about doing things in anticipation of things which haven't happened yet. But now the UAW has happened and or is happening. So yes, I would, I would, I would be very careful in my statements, saying that we're monitoring this very closely, and it may be that inflation will be a bit stronger uh, than than we expected before. Um, I think there is a risk that really catch up comes in. I mean, if I were a worker, uh, I would want to catch up, and if I were in a position to do it, I would try to do it. So I think the Fed is. A bit optimistic, uh, the statement that basically you can be, you can get where you want. It's going to take a while, but with fairly low unemployment, around four percent, I think is uh, probably not my median forecast. On um, the other thing I would say is it looks like the U.S. economy is resilient as Lucrezia said, probably for the reasons she gave, which is that a lot of money was distributed and is still in saving accounts or balance sheets of firms. And so I think we may need higher interest rates. I wouldn't be surprised if it happened. I regret it, but I expect it. On Europe, again, if you don't think there is overheating, then you probably don't want to do much to the economy, don't want to slow it down. You watch like a hawk, the de-anchoring of expectations. So Isabel Schnabel, for example, believes that it may happen or it happens. Uh, if you see it happen, then clearly you have to tighten and you watch for catch up. Uh, if not, then I think you're fairly relaxed. Um, you also take into account the fact that the economy may well slow down on its own uh, for reasons having absolutely nothing to do with monetary policy. And, the discussion of what's happening in Germany and whether the German model uh, is not no longer working and so on is very relevant. So if I were the ECB, I would watch to see whether the economy is not slowing down on its own before adding uh, to the pain. So this is awfully where I am. Great. So I'm going to go to Lucrezia on the anchoring in a, in a second, but I have one follow-up question. For Olivier, so Olivier, you are on, on record as arguing already several years ago that there was a case for raising the inflation target. So you know, on this face of it, this looks like a perfect moment <laughs> for raising the inflation target because we are at three to four percent. It might be difficult to bring it further down, but but at the same time, like you said, your your your, lo your logic uh, pushes you in, into a hawkish uh, direction where you know stopping uh, the uh, disinflation process now may have really big risks uh, and and so you know how how can you reconcile these two uh, these two uh, instincts i mean you have you know the hawkish argument then you have also the worry that we might end up at the effective lower bound sooner rather than later w what do we do do we sort of bring it back down to two and then raise the inflation target? Or how, how would you, you know, it between yourselves or on this? Okay. So first, ignoring how you get there, I still think 3% is better than 2%, quite apart from where we are and what inflation is today or what it will be tomorrow. Um, 3% is better. The question is how to go there if one decides that it is the right number. I indeed, there is indeed a very delicate PR operation uh, 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 needed, uh, which is that I don't think you can say, okay, well, we've got down to 3%, although the ECB is not there yet. But when we get to 3%, we say, okay, that's fine. Uh, it will look like you're giving up on the fight. So I think that for the moment, it is very important that central banks say, you know, we want to get to 2%, maybe not this year, maybe next year and so on. But I don't think they can just say 3% today. I understand completely their position. 
what I would do if I were in their shoes is I would get to 3%, pretending or hoping that it will go to 2 But And when I'm at 3%, I would say, look, let's go slow because the slope of the Phillips curve is very flat. We just don't want uh, to force the economy in a recession in order to get from 3 to 2 So we're going to go there. We're going to do it slowly and we'll get there. And then over time, Maybe it happens, maybe it doesn't happen. And then the discussion continues, which is, well, do we stay at 3% or not? And my hope is at that stage, maybe a year or two into the process, the agreement is, well, maybe we don't need to go to two. Let's just, you know, stay where we are. Uh, playing it out is not, is not obvious. Uh, but I continue to think that 3% would be useful. Let me just add one thing on this, which is people say, well, not 2% or 3%, what difference does it make? So 1% difference for the target means on average 1% difference for nominal rates. Gives you 1% more margin to cut rates if you need. That looks small, but it's roughly what we got by using QE. And QE is a gigantic thing with all kinds of side effects, which I do not, I do not always like. So Yes, it is not a perfect solution, but it is an improvement and not a negligible one. Uh, Lucrezia, let me uh, try to push you a little bit on the patient story. So I don't really know any economist who would argue that the ECB started too early in their tightening. Yet, you know, if the patient story is, is correct, so these are supply shocks that take a long time to percolate through the economy, and the fact that we have high inflation in the meantime is efficient because it, uh, because it uh, promotes uh, uh, sectoral change. Uh, and, uh, you know, certainly so far, expectations have not de-anchored. Would it not follow that maybe the ECB was panicking when it started rising rates and it should have just been sitting there for a while and letting it rip? I didn't say that the ECB should have not tightened. I said that the ECB has, you know, has tightened too much. Actually, I am on record writing, uh, you know, in the beginning of 2022, saying that there is no reason why the ECB should keep on having a negative interest rates when inflation was clearly, you know, rising. Uh, the reason why they were late, however, if you look at the political economy of that decision, uh, is that because they had an idea of sequence uh, between the interest rate and the downsizing of the balance sheet, and uh, which led to all kind of hesitation, but that's a very idiosyncratic uh, European discussion. Uh, so I'm not arguing that they should have not uh, tightened. They, I think they have tightened too much. I think that uh, coming back to some of Olivier's point on, on labor market, uh, uh, I mean, the ECB analysis, uh, you know, they, they themselves, they have, uh, you know, published papers in which they show that labor market, if you look at hours rather than employment, is much less resilient than it may look. And uh, also the beverage curve has shifted uh, quite substantively to, you know, back uh, much more than in the U.S., uh, so there are all, and then of course there are, uh, you know, the forecast uh, uh, that uh, point, uh, you know, to 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 a slow down. Maybe, maybe this is not exactly labor market; it may have other causes. But you know, uh, clearly uh, we are facing quite a different situation from the point of view of, of the real economy. And uh, the question on patients uh, is really how fast you want to go to two percent. And I totally agree with Olivier that 2% uh, is probably not the right level. Uh, if you believe that supply shocks uh, are a big part of the story this time, uh, you, know, supply, you know, supply chain constraints and oil and gas and so on, and then, you know, in the future, and not just in the future, but also in the present climate and so on, and if we believe this argument that the relative prices have to work in, in the right, you know, that the economy has to respond to these changes in relative prices, uh, then this probably means that if there is such thing as the optimal inflation target, it should be a bit higher. 
Uh, there is work, academic work, which you know they're trying to look at the relative prices and uh, and uh, and the ultimate level of inflation target, and they all point that two percent is too low. So, so just not just because of the zero lower bound constraint considerations, but also because of these con these considerations of, of relative prices. Uh, I agree also with Olivier that you cannot just change the target in the middle of the fire. In another report of, that we I co-wrote with various people on the uh, ECB strategy review, before inflation, we said you should have a system so that every such years, you review the target. And with a calendar ex ante, so that uh, you know, this is not, uh, you know, affects the credibility. I think this is something that they should look into in the next uh, strategy review. In the meantime, the only way to, to do is, is you know, to, to be flexible on the timing uh, of, um, of the getting back to, to the 2%, uh, and in principle, this is even in the new strategy, so they could do it. Last question before we go uh, <clears throat> to the floor. So, uh, and this is to both of you, but let me start with Lucrezia. So, so I think the ECB's answer to your call for patience uh, would probably be, actually, we are quite patient, you know, we I'll have a horizon of about until 2025 when we expect inflation to be back at target, but there are limits <laughs> to our patience, and essentially the limit is manifest, manifests itself and the unwillingness to extend the horizon over which a disinflation might be tolerated by the ECB. And as Olivier said, the, the pres presumed reason for this limit is, is the worry about de-anchoring, and so the implicit model of the anchoring that the ECB seems to have is that, you know, f with essentially the probability of the anchoring is proportional, the instantaneous probability of the anchoring is proportional to the observed inflation level or to the distance from the target. I'm not sure whether core or, or headline. Uh, and so that, you know, we are taking a risk. Uh, as the longer we wait, the bigger the risk. And then, you know, we don't really know how this works, so if the anchoring happens, it might be sudden, it might be irreversible, and then, of course, the costs of disinflation are going to be much higher. So th I think that's sort of the story that's behind th their reluctance to to follow you as, as much as you would like. And, and so the natural question is, what is the evidence? So, you know, Olivier essentially implied a a slow de-anchoring process, right? So you, you can watch this happen in the data, and you have time to react to it and tighten if it happens. Is, is there evidence that would suggest this story is right? Is there evidence that suggests that the anchoring is more like flipping a switch? It's nonlinear. Conference, uh, there was a paper on inflation expectation and what is the value of the work on inflation expectation for monetary policy, and the conclusion is that there is no value, okay? So nobody understands inflation expectations. Okay, the professional forecasts that long-term, they're anchored and super anchored, they don't move no matter what happens. While consumer expectations move a lot, they're too volatile, so maybe uninformative. So clearly, you know, central banks have to, you know, to do their work, so they have to look at a number of things, and they keep on saying that they're looking at the data, and so the labor market is the obvious, and the, and the wage and profit dynamics is the obvious way to look. Maybe more than this inflation expectations uh, data, which are not particularly informative. Uh, I mean, there is some information, okay, so let's not exaggerate, but... What I don't buy in the ECB uh, uh, speeches or some of their, uh, of their board members uh, is this idea of robustness that uh, because you want to have robust monetary policy, you, you know, the risk of doing uh, too much are less than the risk of doing too little. Um, and uh, I mean, I think that uh, you know a euro euro economy that uh, slides into another recession after the one that we had in 2020, the one we had in 2011, the one we had in 2008, could be quite bad. There is also work that points that uh, you know these kind of episodes have a serious effect. They you know you've seen the data on investment and on consumption, but investment in particular, they are quite uh, terrible. And we don't have uh, Joe Biden uh, giving, uh, you know, checks right and left. On the contrary, you just wrote a paper that points to the fact that the fiscal stance is going to be 
quite uh, restrictive in the years to come. So, you know, both monetary and fiscal policy are moving uh, in the restricted direction, so I definitely worry about it. Uh, Olivier, do you want to uh, add to the uh, expectations formation discussion or anything? Yeah, uh, thanks. I, as I was listening, I, I make three, three points to two of them on the earlier uh, interchange. The first one is not moving nominal rates when inflation is increasing, is actually not neutral, right, with policy. It's loosening, right, because the real rate goes down. And so, you know, at just increasing the rate with inflation, less than one for one is not enough, as we know, just to keep uh, to keep neutral. So I think the Fed, uh, the ECB had to increase rates. Uh, there's no question. Uh, uh, the, uh, the second thing is on the 2%. So Lucrezia, uh, insisted rightly on the fact that we may get more relative price uh, movement, and therefore this by itself suggests a higher target for inflation to make it easier. But remember that the 2% was based on the conclusion that the probability that we would hit the zero lower bound was extremely small. And in in effect, uh, we hit it, you know, consistently, persistently from the time it was, it was uh, the target was chosen. So it's clear that the computation was wrong, and that element is is also very important. On the anchoring, so again, the econometric ev evidence is is quite striking. I mean, if you basically do regressions of whatever measure of longer expectations you want on itself and uh, inflation, actual inflation, the coefficient has not increased. It's not zero. People react, but it's extremely small, and it has not increased at all. When you try to look for non-linearities, for example, inflation, inflation square, you know, regression, then you also don't see uh, non-linearity. Now, it could be zero one. It could be that suddenly people just now you see me. In addition to uh, to hearing me, sorry. Uh, the uh, it may be that it will suddenly come. And when it comes, it's forever and it's catastrophic. But again, there is very little evidence. I mean, it's absolutely striking how anchored long-run expectations have been in the face of very large movements in inflation, both ways, actually. So do you want to do it or not? I mean, it seems to me that the trade-off is you take the risk uh, if you tighten. You take the risk, not take the risk, you, don't, you actually increase unemployment for sure against decreasing the risk that something which hasn't happened doesn't happen, uh, does happen. And it seems to me that the trade-off is very unappealing. So uh, again, I think we can probably react very quickly as soon as you see some change, significant change in expectation formation, then react. But before that, doing it just because it could happen seems to me to be wrong. Okay, so um, I will go to the floor now, but before that, I will give sort of my preliminary conclusion as far as the answer to the title question is concerned. Can we claim victory of, over inflation? It seems to me that the panel has ruled on this that the answer for the US is definitely no, and for the euro area, quite possibly. Uh, we may not know it yet, but quite possibly we, we have. And of course, that is ironic since um, the disinflation process is further along in the US. Don't react to this now. <laughs> you can contradict me if I've caricatured your views too far. So let's go to the floor. Let's co collect uh, a few questions. Uh, anyone in the audience? Uh, Friedrich uh, Lucke, please, and Francesco Papadia, and uh, Lucio Peng uh, in that sequence. And then well, I will take one from Slido uh, in addition. So this is uh, Friedrich Lucke from Hi, thanks a lot for your talk. I'm Friedrich Lucke. I work for the Joint Research Center of the European Commission. I have two questions, in fact. The first one regards this catch-up in labor, uh, in catch-up in wages that we have not seen. And the question is, do you think that part of this catch-up could have been absorbed by non-monetary benefits that workers may have been getting for blue-collar workers who were, for instance, very exposed to uh, the, the health risks of COVID? that quit their jobs en masse, uh, that uh, their working conditions have improved, or for white collar workers that they get to stay at home much more and work from there so they don't have to commute. Do you think that this could have um, uh, 
absorb part of that wage increase we didn't see. And my second question concerns the effect of the uh, Trump uh, fiscal stimulus that we saw during COVID. Do you think that the rapid disinflation that we've been seeing could be interpreted as evidence that the inflation we saw was more or less driven by fiscal reasons, that sort of the markets immediately formed the expectations on how much of these extraordinary spending programs would just eventually be, be monetized. So once that process happened very quickly, because they were not expecting more spending, deficit, uh, deficit finance spending in the future, that uh, inflation decreased very rapidly. Thank you so much. Very nice. Uh, Francesco Papadia from Bruegel, please, former ECB. Thank you very much. Uh, two questions. The first one uh, is very simple. Um, it took some imagination uh, to say that price stability means 2% rate of inflation. Uh, I mean, it's not obvious. I mean, you say zero uh, is the price stability, uh, not 2%. Okay, I mean, after some thought, it was decided, no, two is okay. Is the three okay? Uh, is it still price stability? Do we have to change the Maastricht Treaty? Uh, to say, well, no, no, not price stability. We have to have something close to price stability, or uh, you choose, or something like that. My first question. My second question is, <clears throat> what would Lucrezia in particular make uh, of the story um, that I understand the ECB is making? We want to send a strong signal to firms that they have to uh, be prudent uh, on their prices uh, because we give them reassurance that inflation will be back sometimes in 2025, uh, so that there is some compression of uh, profit margins that can uh, give some more uh, wage uh, concessions and recover part uh, of the loss uh, of the real wages uh, that, uh, that occurred because of uh, inflation. What's wrong with this signaling uh, story? Not uh, high for long, but give a clear signal, and maybe when things go, go well, you reduce rates. Okay, and finally we have uh, Lucio Pink, uh, formerly of the European Commission, now at Bruegel. No, we'll go uh, back yes, I have a question for uh, Lucrezia, in the like, actually, of a remark that uh, Olivier made that was also in my mind, that, namely that you should be looking at the, real, at the level of the real rate. So my question is the following. Even if one agrees on, with the story that you presented, would still be right, and in a sense I would like also to hear what Olivier would say, to argue that the stance of the ECB, maybe I misunderstood you, is overly restrictive. I mean, looking at market expectation, I think I had an exchange with the Francesco the other week, basically you see that if things pans out as in the market expectation, the rate will go down at 2% when inflation goes down to 2%. So basically, so you get that, uh, assuming that at this point you are at a neutral rate, I mean you are a neutral rate of zero, and if you assume that the neutral rate is zero, throughout the entire episode, you will not ever see a tight uh, stance of monetary policy, at least as defined by uh, the real interest rate being uh, above the natural rate. So what I'm saying, and so I would also like to, know, to see what uh, Olivier thinks, is that uh, even if your story on the importance, the underestimated importance of supply shock is correct, still you could defend what the ECB has been doing and where it is, perhaps saying that they should not be increasing further. Okay, uh, back to the panel. Uh, Olivier, do you want to start? Um, on catch-up, I suspect that it's true for some workers. It's a very good point. I had not thought about it, but it's clear that for some workers, being able to work from home is worth a whole lot. And therefore, maybe you don't want to uh, to ask for a higher real wage. You're happy with what you got. Seems less relevant for the people who actually have to go to work every day, like the UAW people. Um, so that it may be where it's going to come from if it comes from somewhere. Um, uh, on the two, on the zero percent, two percent, three percent, what is the right definition of price stability? I think, as economists, we tend to think that the positive rate, uh, inflation rate, is is right. 
or various reasons, uh, which we've just gone through. How high do you want it to be? I think the issue of salience is what I've been pushing in the past, which is you basically want to allow inflation to be such that people don't want to think about it the way they didn't think about it for about 15 years before uh, COVID. Uh, and the evidence is at 2%, people don't think much about inflation. They don't think much about movements in inflation of 1% or not. Uh, the evidence is when you get to 4%, which is a number that once I, I pushed once, uh, I think there people start taking it into account, firms start to take it into account. It complicates things. People become much more obsessed with changes in inflation. So the conclusion is it's a trade-off. Uh, and I think 3% is probably more or less uh, the right number. But that's how I think about price stability. You don't think about it. Um, and on uh, Lucio's point, yeah, I completely agree. Um, you know, the, the real rates are not crazy high. Uh, they, are, they are positive, uh, at least in the US at this point, uh, for most of the yield curve, I think. But they are not very high, and they're still less than the anticipated growth rate. Um, you know, I care very much about R minus G, so I think it's still going the right way for the most part. It is higher than it was pre-COVID, so it may be that even neutral rate is really minus 1% or minus 2%. Then we're above this, and monetary policy is contractionary. But in general, yes, I, you know, people complain very much of high rates, but again, in real terms, they are not, they are not insane, uh, and they may not be high enough. We'll see. Look at you. Yeah. Um, so let me start for, from the from the last question. So oh, are real interest rate high or not? Really, that depends on what is your view on R star. And as we know, everybody has a different idea about what is the level of R stars. But the ECB view itself on the difference between R and R stars is that we are in positive territory. So we are in restricted territory. And this is the way they want to be, okay? Because they believe that uh, you know inflation is, uh, uh, you know, that if they were less in the restricted territory, then uh, you know the 2025 uh, path that they anticipate, you know, and considering market expectations, uh, will be a different one, okay? So I mean, if you if you look at their own analysis, you know that gap, R minus R stars, is firmly positive, okay? Now, uh, I mean, this is the ECB analysis, which is what counts, okay, to understand their stance, okay, what I think is less, less interesting. What the market thinks about our stars, it really depends on the horizon. If you look at the five year five to five years, our stars uh, is basically back to zero, if not negative, okay, for the euro area. So we are in very restricted <laughs> territories. Uh, now, so I mean, this, this is basically, so there is a market view and then there is the ECB view, view, but both are consistent in saying that they are in restricted territory. What the ECB says is that they have been in restricted territory only recently, okay? So that, that's, the, that's there, and you can argue about those numbers, but nobody's saying that the ECB is in an easy territory right now. Um, so, um, now, on, uh, on price stability, is 2% the right thing or not? I think you, know, you could have an academic answer or a practical answer. In, a, in the academic literature, to have a price stability, optimal inflation target, which is different than zero, is very hard, okay? You really have to put a lot of stuff in your model to get away from zero. However, if you, uh, if you look at uh, multi-sector models with relative price adjustments, and this is the, the work of Klaus Adams, which I also done it with very micro prices to look at uh, what is the effect uh, of um, you know, relative price changes uh, on the calculation of an, optimal, of an optimal inflation target in a model with price rigidities, and the number for Italy is 4%, okay? And so this is from somebody who's definitely is not uh, a dovish guy, okay? But uh, uh, in fact, it was very difficult to publish that paper because of, of that number. Uh, but you know, that's the academic answer. I mean, in practice, I agree with Olivier that, uh, you know, you don't want to be uh, at a level which is too close to zero because of the zero lower bound concern. 
And, <laughs> but you know, it's an open question. So there is no firm answer that it has to be to zero. I mean, we want inflation to be low and stable, you know, but not necessarily, you know, what is that level? And, you know, practical considerations suggest that maybe 3% is the. And on, on, on labor market, I mean, I'm not an expert, but I guess that a lot of changes, structural changes in labor market, uh, you know, suggest what you're suggesting. And, uh, and also, you know, that labor is very fragmented, so, you know, we don't have strong unions anymore. Right. Uh, so I, we are basically out of time, but I do want to uh, give a just a, a chance to a couple of questions from uh, Slido. So there's one from Marek Dabrowski, which um, I think is directed to Lucrezia and essentially tries to bring in a bit of more of a, a, a monetarist uh, perspective. Um, he says, from February 2020, the size of the Fed balance sheet doubled. In the ECB, it almost doubled. What was the impact of this increase on inflation? So if you can take that, and then, I don't know, Olivier, if you can see the other questions, but they are basically up your alley, whether the lack of labor market catch-up, so wage catch-up, is, is really unusual historically, and if there are structural changes like declining bargaining power that can, that can explain this. Uh, there's also a question of whether the Fed should give more weight to the employment mandate at this uh, at this point. Um, and finally, there's a question on uh, which I don't completely understand, but you may you may a lot of pre 2020 work focused on the role of income risk and wages wage rather than price rigidity. Do these features play a role in diverging U.S. versus EU dynamics? So just uh, pick and choose among this, but. Let's start with uh, with Lucrezia on, on Marek's point. Yeah, on the on the balance sheet, I mean, I think it's now well understood that the size of the balance sheet uh, is uh, has nothing to do with inflation. Uh, you know, to the extent to which uh, the, the the you know the size of the balance sheet has increased in response to demand for reserves, so or this should not be inflationary. And, uh, you know, because it's, it responds to, uh, to demand, okay? This is how the operational framework uh, works now and has been worked since 2008. So now we have interest rate on reserves, so basically we have different instruments, so that there is no, no rela immediate relationship between the size of the balance sheet and inflation. But if you want to look at the monetary indicator as some indicators about future inflation pressures, if you look at... Uh, uh, you know, M3 uh, or any other indicator like that, they have been, uh, you know, declining uh, at a very rapid rate. Uh, Olivier, any, any final remarks on any of these questions? Okay, first I want to endorse Lucrezia's answer. I mean, there's no relation between the balance sheet and inflation uh, when money pays interest. It's basically, QE is basically a, a change in the composition of liabilities. Now, it may have an effect, it decreases some rates, and that decrease may affect demand, but that's the channel. It's not the size of the balance sheet. I think this has to be said and said and said and said again. Um, the other point I will take is why not catch up? I'm confused. I'm honestly confused. I mean, clearly we understand that in the US, unions are very weak, uh, except for the UAW, uh, and that other things equal, they other things equal, they're not in a strong position to ask for anything, but when the unemployment rate is 3.5%, you tend to think that they would be able to, and firms are desperate to find workers. So I don't know, maybe it just takes time, and maybe again, that's why I don't want to declare victory, because it could come, and maybe it takes time. Uh, in Europe, I again, we don't find catch-up, and um, you know, unions are stronger, and I uh, Again, maybe the measures we have are not the right ones. I do not know, but that's clearly an important research issue and an important policy issue. We we don't usually advertise other other institutions' work here, but there is a, a really excellent podcast by the New York Times and the Daily on the historical background of the uh, UW uh, UAW uh, strike last week, which I would recommend very enlightening. So we, we have to close. Um, I think f this has been a real crash course. Um, uh, I have learned a lot and and um, I think, I hope you have discovered things that will make you think differently and certainly uh, uh, get you closer to the answer on, on whether inflation has been conquered or not. So let me thank both Lucrezia and Olivier very, very much um, and we will see you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.